Behind the Guitar is brought to you by the Martin Guitar Foundation, RCN, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Recorded live from the campus of Steel Stacks in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, ladies and gentlemen, our host, Craig Thatcher. On this episode of Behind the Guitar, we'll be sitting down with classical guitarist and educator John Arnold. Please put your hands together as we go Behind the Guitar with John Arnold. Welcome to the show, John. We haven't had a classical player until now, so I'm very excited to have you on with us today. Great, thanks for having me. Why don't you do a number for us? Let's, let's talk a little bit about your uh, background and, and why you chose the classical guitar studies. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Um, it's kind of a, it goes way back to my, um, my parents. They played guitar when I was little. And um, they both you know, played chords and strummed Beatles songs and mm -hmm. things like that, which I still love to do. And uh, that really inspired me. And I think my mother could tell how much I loved that. So she gave me her guitar. And then for years and years, I. I did that kind of music, still do, and then my teenage years, as many of us, we turned to the dark side rock and roll, <laughs> and uh, you know, I got my uh, first electric guitar, and I, I was heavily into Pink Floyd and um, Zeppelin and all that, and um, still love that stuff. But what I mostly loved about those guys was their acoustic numbers, like you know, um, Black Mountain Side, sure. the Dad Gag yes. kind of tunings, Jimmy Page. yeah, and um, you know, all the acoustic stuff. I was really drawn to that, and. Um, and then something happened. Some friends of mine asked me to go see a, a guitarist, fingerstyle guitarist. His name was Phil Keggy. Oh, sure. M monster mm -hmm. fingerstyle guy. And, and I just was blown away. I didn't know that kind of thing could be done on the guitar. So I was just sold right then and there. And shortly after that, I found Michael Hedges. Ah. You know, and, um, and so I um, wanted to do that for my life. I wanted to be a Michael Hedges, Phil Keggy kind of guy, you know, my own stuff, but that style, that's, you know, slapping and alternate tunings and things like that. Mm -hmm. and so I thought by um, going to a conservatory and getting training, it would, it would help me out a lot to study classical guitar. So that's how I got into classical guitar. And I went to Shenandoah University, where Glenn Kaluta taught for nearly 40 years, headed up an incredible guitar program. I had the, the just, uh, it was just amazing to study with him and an incredible teacher. And um, he showed me the world of classical, and I had no idea I was going to get sucked into that black hole, and, and there was no return, you know. Um, 
But uh, I still love the finger style stuff, but um, that's how I got into classical. Well, the classical guitar studies, I know back when I was in high school, I, I studied with a man named Joseph Mays for a short oh, I time. I know Joe Mays. Yeah, yeah I sh I, he was a Segovia student, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did it to, to kind of learn how to use my fingers of my right hand. So it helped whatever, uh, whatever I do today when I'm doing, well, on a steel string guitar, it has helped to do that for sure. So you, uh, are, where are you originally from? Uh, born in Michigan, ah. lived there less than a year, and then moved to Richmond, Virginia area, and, and grew up mostly in Northern Virginia, and then I've lived in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania the last 15 years, and okay. love it here. It's a great area. Great. Well, why don't you play us another number? That I'd was such to. a beautiful piece. Thank it's you. Thanks. Well, the reason I chose that number, um, that happened around the t turn of the 20th century, and uh, Tarig, as I mentioned, was from Spain. So classical guitarists today, if you go on a, uh, to a concert guitar, classical concert program, you will see mostly the standard staples of the repertoire from these European guys, and you will always see that as great stuff. But going on at that same time, in America, there were uh, dozens of composers writing right here, mm -hmm. and, and nobody plays this stuff anymore. It's very sad. It's kind of a lost chapter in the classical guitar history. You'll never see it on a concert program. Um, so I'd like to play a couple pieces from um, the same time period while that last piece was going on of these Americans who uh, unfortunately have just kind of got swept under the rug. So this is a piece by uh, William Foden and this was his model and this is called Admiration Waltz. Mm -hmm.
Beautiful job. Thank you. I'm glad you picked such easy pieces. <laughs> my, my. You know, just, just the, uh, the technique and practice you must put in. How much practice time do you actually need to, to get so proficient? Um, never enough. Um, I try to get in, I like to get in ideally four hours a day, but sometimes it's two or three, you know, whatever I can get in. It's never enough. How about when you were starting out, say when you were studying at the uh, university, uh, did you get more or less? Because I know they, they, you know, you have a lot of other courses, so yeah, even though funny. that guitar is your major, you have all the other courses to keep up with as well. That's tough. Yeah, definitely. It's I think I had more time then, you know, because now family, jobs, and sure. stuff. But I still sneak it in as much as possible. You know. So uh, your educational background, once you, once you left the university, what did you do after that? Well, um, I loved studying with Glenn Kaluta so much. I did my undergraduate and master's with him. Ah. And then he finally kicked me out. He's like, you got to <laughs> spread your wings and go. So I finally did. And I went to the University of Hartford and, and got an artist diploma degree in classical guitar. And then um, I got the job at teaching in Moravian College. And I moved here and been here for 15 years. And I first met you at Moravian when you actually would present the guitar festival, the Bethlehem Guitar Festival. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a, a, um, a wonderful festival we had for mm. 13 years, and we brought in um, some of the greatest artists, including Craig Thatcher and Dick Bogle. We brought them from all over the world, and um, that was a great deal of fun. Unfortunately, we retired it, and uh, it's just time to move on to a different chapter, but that was a lot of fun. And, uh, you did a phenomenal job. Oh, thank you. That, was, you that was when you opened it up to steel string guitars. Yeah, the last, I think, four years we did, and that was a wonderful thing. Brought in people like Lawrence Juber. Yeah, sure. We've had Lawrence on the show. Yeah, he's incredible. Yeah, he certainly is. So what are you doing uh, as far as your uh, teaching goes? I know a lot of classical guitars, a lot of guitarists in general, but classical guitars always are, are renowned for teaching. Uh, I teach in Moravian College classical guitar, but I also um, teach at what formerly was called LBPA. It's now uh, the Lehigh Valley Charter High School for the Arts, and um, they have a guitar program there. I started teaching there two years ago, and it's wonderful. I absolutely love it. Some great kids, really hungry to learn classical guitar. What do you so, get out of teaching? Um, I, you know, the biggest thing I get out of, of teaching is when somebody really gets excited about learning mm -hmm. and falls in love with the repertoire and just really has that intrinsic motivation and discipline to want to practice and reap the benefits of, of what practice can do and to watch them grow as, as students into mature players. It's exciting. It really is, yeah. It really, and it must be very rewarding to find young folks, young, young students, mm -hmm. who are into this classical music. Yeah, um, like myself, I was a rock and roller, you know, so I get a lot of people signing up for lessons thinking they're going to be jamming Jimi Hendrix in a week and a half, and, you know, and then I give them some music to read and talk about technique, and, you know, they're like, whoa, but, you know, <laughs> if I can keep them down that path, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool to watch it unveil for them. Do you know what's interesting? I, I just thought of this as you're speaking there. Uh, guitar tablature tablature as opposed to notation, tablature showing numbers where you place your fingers on six strings rather than this, the musical staff. Yeah. So popular today mm -hmm. all over the internet and everything and all the, a lot of younger players are really uh, into reading tablature. Uh, it's interesting to note that that actually started with the lute, if I'm not mistaken. You're exactly right. It was like um, 1500s and mm -hmm. it was uh, a million times more sophisticated. There was French, German, Italian tablature hybrids, um, way more intricate. Rhythms all integrated inside it, and it was really fantastic. I mean, there are scholars who study it now. The tablature. Yeah, and transcribe it into modern notation. And so it's not really anything new. <laughs> no, it's been, yeah, a lot of people think, you know, tab is like 25 years old. Right. Or so. No, it's been around for centuries. How about that? And it's, and it's really beautiful to look at, too. How about playing uh, another piece, please? Yeah, I'd like to play one more piece by my, uh, one of my new heroes, William Foden. And this guy lived with very, um, he was very dominant, a dominant force in the turn of the 20th century and um, very famous in his day. And uh, unfortunately, he's kind of forgotten about. That's, I just played Admiration Waltz by him. And I'll play one more by him called Capital March. And um, you definitely can hear some American patriotic 
feel in there, but there's also some ragtime feel in there too, so it's, it's fun stuff. All this going on during the time of Targa and mm -hmm. those other guys. So um, this is called Capital March. Fun piece. Yeah. Thank you. A lot of fun. We were talking earlier uh, about Andre Segovia, mm. and I had the great fortune to actually see uh, <laughs> Mr. Segovia in concert. Um, I guess he was probably 90 years old. It was very shortly before he passed away. But uh, when I watch your right hand, oh my, it's pretty amazing. You have a wonderful right hand. Better than Segovia? Uh, well, <laughs> Is that now, what you're getting now, at? Now, yeah, his right hand isn't doing too well right now. I can now. read between the lines. But, <laughs> but no, really, I'm really impressed with that, uh, particularly oh, with your right hand. Thank you. What do you look for in a guitar sound or a guitar tone? What, what kind of uh, hmm. prerequisite or criteria do you have for that? Yeah, that, that's a really good question, and it can be very personal, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's different for steel string versus um, the nylon string. Uh, that would have been on gut in the early 20th century. Um, yeah, they're different tones, the strings, but in terms of the woods, you're looking for a high quality, solid piece of wood, not laminated pieces of plywood, a solid piece of high quality wood. And, and the way the bracing is made inside, whether it's scalloped or it's, the luthier, the maker can shape it to have tonal qualities that where it projects very loud or even, warmer, brighter, all kinds of uh, nuances that players look for. Sure. Uh, we're going to go a little bit more uh, in depth on that okay. with our good friend and uh, world-renowned guitar expert, Mr. Dick Boak. Take it away, Dick. Thank you, Craig. Well, one of the guitars that John was playing is uh, uh, 
uh, made in 1921. Vada Alcott Bickford, Bickford the, the artist in question, loved the high quality of the wood without any of the fanciness. So this is Brazilian rosewood, Adirondack spruce of the highest quality, and uh, a little decal here, Alcott Bickford artist modeling. You see it has violin pegs on the back. Uh, they really work very well. Um, the more modern metal pegs are used on most guitars these days. Thank you very much, Dick. So, John, what are you presently working on? What kind of projects do you have on? Yeah, um, I'm presently working on the music of William Foden and his contemporaries, mm -hmm. and um, I've uh, been doing a ton of research and um, finding just uh, many composers who are unknown, and it's so much music out there from this time period, early 20th century, and, and uh, some of it's not very good, some of it's kind of bad parlor music, but with some of it's outstanding, and some of it's incredibly virtuosic, you know, like theme and variations of 40 pages of crazy stuff, you know, and wow. I'm not ready to tackle that just yet, <laughs> but, uh, but there's some incredible music, so I want to make a CD hopefully this fall, and um, of, uh, I don't know, have a title for the CD yet, but, you know. Well, we'll certainly be looking forward to hearing that. Yeah. And, and your teaching schedule. What kind of a teaching schedule do you have at the moment? Well, I, like I said, I teach at Moravian College and the Trader Arts High School, and I teach every day at both these schools. Oh, Fortunately, wow. they're less than a mile away from each other, uh -huh. so just running back and forth is pretty easy. But uh, that's my day, pretty much. Well, that's great. You know, I mean, classical guitar is not the kind of guitar you're going to go out into a bar or, you know, yeah. and see the, you know, on the weekend. It's not the Friday and Saturday night type of uh, entertainment that you traditionally see, at least in our area in the Northeast. Uh, so it's wonderful to see that you're able to present concerts, do recordings, uh, and different uh, private events. I'm sure you probably have some private events that you do. Do a lot of private events, yeah. 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 Do you do any uh, collaborations at all with other artists? Yeah, I spent, I did uh, 11 years with Nora Suggs in the area. She's a flautist, and we, uh, we toured and recorded quite a bit, and um, we lasted 11 years and still great friends. I'm just moving on to other things like the new project I have, and I was with Satori, that's chamber music, and I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with those guys. Those are incredible musicians. And it was just they sure a, are. a dream to work with them. So. That's great. Well, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show today. I appreciate you, you're it. A wealth you. of information, a fantastic player. Oh. Uh, really like your interpretations. And again, uh, just your relaxed feel. You have such a light touch. Is that typical of a classical guitarist to have such a light touch? Um, we are always trying to get rid of negative tension. You know, you see a lot of uh -huh. guitar players and their arms like this and their face is contorted, you know, and, you know, and we're always trying That's to like... rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it look hard when it's easy. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but no, we are always trying to get rid of negative tension in the hands because there's so much work to be done, counterpoint, and um, so I wish I could say it's all out of my hands. It's a never-ending thing we work on, so... Why don't you do one more number for us before well, you leave? I'd love to. Um, would you join me? With oh, I'd be pleased. That'd be great. Thank um, you. Uh, this is a piece called Ashokan Farewell, and it was, you may recognize it from um, the Civil War series that was out um, a number of years ago. Uh, it was a th theme song for that, but it actually wasn't written in the Civil War time. It was written by Jay Unger, who has a, a uh, music camp in Vermont, I believe it is. And he wrote this as a farewell to the camp one summer. And it, it called on for the Civil War series. But it's a beautiful piece. And um, I love it so much, uh, especially the nostalgia behind it as my wife walked down the aisle to this piece. So I uh -huh. love this piece. So.